This event was sponsored by Spock, the Bootsy Lab for Beautiful Things, PS PDF Kit. With the JavaScript library, you can view and annotate PDF files in the browser. Features include cross-browser support, mobile-optimized UI, and no server-side component. Wild, a digital branding studio, they love GIFs, beer, and weird shit. XXX Lutz, the tech team, XXXL Digital creates all digital experience for XXL Lutz, Mobilix, and Momax all over Europe. All right, well, today we're going to talk about a lot of cool new things happening in the GraphQL ecosystem. And over the next 30 minutes, you're going to learn about our newest major version of Apollo Client and how it can simplify your life as a developer. Does that sound cool? Yeah, yeah. yeah awesome. Um, so before we get started, I wanted to introduce myself. Hi, my name is Peggy Rezis, and if you need to reach me or if you have any questions about my presentation, you can find me on Twitter and my handle right there. Um, and I am an engineer at Meteor Development Group on the Apollo team where I help build open source GraphQL tools. So our main goal as the Apollo team and community is to make building applications simpler and faster with GraphQL. And I think this goal has really resonated with the community. We've seen astounding growth over the past year, resulting in over 2.5 million NPM downloads and almost 5,000 stars on GitHub for our most popular tool, Apollo Client. And it's also the most widely used GraphQL client in the ecosystem today. And I think one of the reasons we've had so much success is because building your application with Apollo Client removes a ton of complexity on the front end. So even if you're not familiar with GraphQL, all you have to do here is just describe the data that you want. So here in this example, we are querying for exchange rates and we're passing in a type of currency as a variable. And from the exchange rates we get back in an array of those objects, we only want the currency symbol and rate properties. There might be other properties on that object, maybe you know, a logo or some sort of metadata, but GraphQL allows us to choose only the data that we need and nothing more. And to use that data in your application, all you have to do is bind the query to your component and forget about the rest. Now, I'm not trying to make a cheap shot on rest here. Uh, you know, what I'm really referring to is all of the rest of the things associated with data management that you don't have to worry about when you're using Apollo Client. So forget about fetching the data, forget about transforming the response, normalizing, caching it. Apollo Client does all of that for you. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So another thing that I want to point out here, which I think is really cool, is it's not just React developers who can take advantage of all the amazing features in Apollo Client. So just a quick show of hands, who would consider themselves not a React developer? Maybe an Angular view? OK, we see, we see a couple here. That's awesome. Um, so the client is actually decoupled from the view, later, view layer. So Angular and Vue developers can also join in on the fun here. And everything I'm about to tell you for Apollo Client is actually the same for all three frameworks. The only thing that's different is the implementation with how you bind your queries to your components. And I also want to point out, while although uh, my team specifically focuses mostly on React, our Angular and Vue packages are actually community maintained, which allows us to be better tuned into those ne the needs of Angular and Vue developers. I'd also like to give a quick shout out to uh, Camille Casilla, the maintainer of Apollo Angular, and also Guillaume Shao, the maintainer of Vue Apollo, for all their excellent work on our Vue integrations. So I think a lot of times when we talk about Apollo, um, the first thing that probably comes to mind is GraphQL. But you actually don't need a special client to use GraphQL in your application. I mean, if you really wanted to, you could use like jQuery, you could use vanilla JS. They're just post requests. And don't get me wrong, GraphQL is awesome, but Apollo Client is much more than GraphQL. And it has a lot of features that make your life easier. The reasons that you would actually choose to build your app with Apollo Client, in my opinion, extend far beyond GraphQL. And that's really what I'm trying to get across today. But don't just take my word for it, because like I'm biased. I work there. Um, let's just hear from the community. 
So it doesn't matter whether you're an Angular, a Vue, or a React developer, everyone can reap the benefits of building their application with Apollo Client. I love this quote from Brent on the Expo team about building their React Native app. I mean, how many times have you built something and it just works? I mean, that's pretty amazing in my opinion. <laughs> Uh, the KLM team also had a really great experience using Apollo. They were able to replace NGRX altogether in their Angular application, which removed a ton of complexity and allowed them to delete a lot of code. And I really love hearing success stories like Tom's because there's no better feeling than deleting a lot of code, am I right? <laughs> Another really cool perk of using Apollo Client is our Chrome extension that allows you to inspect your store, and track queries, and even run queries in graphical. And combined with the Vue dev tools, the Apollo dev tools enabled Lawrence and his team at Lab7 to iterate quicker while ensuring stability in their application. So I think one of the themes that we can kind of pull out from all these accounts and experiences of all the developers working with Apollo Client is that it allows them to do more with way less code. And before I started working at Apollo, I was an engineer on the UI team at Major League Soccer. And I wrote about our experience uh, switching to Apollo. Offloading data management to Apollo allowed us to delete nearly all of our Redux code, which removed a ton of complexity from our application. And instead of writing countless lines of boilerplate, we just wrote queries and then we let Apollo client take care of the rest. The KLM team also saw similar success. So for each feature that they switched to Apollo, they were able to delete nearly 11 files of NGRX store effects code from their Angular application. And we really love to hear these types of stories. So if you have one, please get in touch with me either on Twitter uh, so, we can so we can feature you on the Apollo blog. So not only do you have to write less data management code, you can also accomplish uh, complicated features like pagination, polling, optimistic UI, uh, prefetching data with far less code than you normally would have to. This is a really cool example in Expo Snack. And as you can see, um, doing pagination is like less than eight lines of code. So it's really easy to uh, build complicated features quickly. So one of the best features of Apollo is that uh, it actually caches your data for you. So let's kind of like break down what's happening uh, when you're requesting data. So from your UI, you send a query, and Apollo client processes that query. And what we do when we process it, we add uh, fields like type name, and then we omit any fields that are already in the store. So then Apollo fetches the data from your GraphQL server, and then once the result comes back, Apollo normalizes the data for you, stores it, and then pushes the result back to your UI. So I've said the word like normalize a couple of times, but what does it actually mean when I say Apollo normalizes your data for you? So first what we do, um, so like picture a GraphQL query in your head and it's nested and you have all those different fields. Um, so we split each part of the query into its own object and then we assign it a unique identifier. So in this example we have like entry one, um, I'm sorry the font's probably really small, but it says entry one, comment one, um, and then so these identifiers are used as pointers between child nodes and the parent. So um, if you can squint you can kind of see comment one under the entry one parent right there. So then we store uh, each object in like a flattened data structure. So you can kind of see there that uh, even though like comment is a child of entry, they're still kind of stored on that same root level. Um, and before we send the data back to the client, we then piece together the shape of the query um, in the result that we expect. So like why do we do all this? This sounds like a whole lot of work. Um, and the reason why is because multiple queries can sometimes share the same data. So in this example, if we add a comment here to entry one, um, we want all the other queries that use entry one to also update. So maybe we're pulling like the top and uh, the top entries query or like the hot entries query. Either way, we want all of the references to entry one to be updated with the new comment count. So this all sounds great. Um, like why did we decide to release a new major version? I mean, we have caching, we can delete all our state management code, life is great, developers around the world love building their apps with Apollo. Um, so like, why fix what isn't broken? Um, 
And it's, it's really not broken, actually. <laughs> the reason for that is because uh, we're looking to the future of the GraphQL ecosystem. So kind of the first question that comes to mind is GraphQL is a query language. So how do we use that query language for different types of data sources? Many data sources can send back a JSON response. That's really the only requirement here. So why do we have to limit ourselves to just GraphQL servers? When it comes to caching, one size does not fit all. How can we decouple the cache from Apollo client so developers can customize it to fit their needs? For example, if that normalization process does not work for them. Um, and additionally, we also see directives as a source of innovation. So um, there's been new directives proposed, ones like defer and ones like stream. And what they do is they, uh, they're kind of designed with supporting multiple results from a GraphQL query. And under our current infrastructure, which is promise-based, you can only send back one result. So we need to kind of move to a new architecture that supports multiple return values uh, so we can move past the issue with GraphQL where an entire result needs to be constructed before we can then send it back to the client. So without further ado, I am really excited to announce the official release of Apollo Client 2.0. Who's excited? <laughs> <laughs> it's anywhere from two to five times faster, depending on your application. It's 40% smaller and designed with minimal breaking changes. Uh, in fact, you can actually upgrade from 1.0 in only a few lines of code. So here's how you would set up Apollo Client 2.0 in your application. Not a whole lot has changed here, um, but there are really two key differences to be aware of. So now the constructor um, specifically requires a cache property and a link property on the configuration object. And the defaults, which I'm showing here, um, the in-memory cache and the HTTP link, um, are pretty much equivalent to the old network interface um, and cache that we had in the 1.0 version. So probably for like, I don't know, like 80 to 90% of users, this is what you're going to need to do to upgrade. It's, it's barely any changes at all. Um, but let's break down the internals of the client even further because, I mean, why did we decide to go through all this work and, you know, re reconfigure the architecture if 90% of use cases were already solved? Um, so there's really a lot of key differences here that kind of open up the possibilities uh, in GraphQL. In 2.0, you can actually now swap out the default in-memory cache with a custom one if you want. And this is huge because our old cache actually used to be dependent upon Redux. So this will allow you to plug in a cache with a different state management library. You could use MobX um, you know, if you really want to. And all you really have to do here is just like create your own and swap it out. So on the right, we also have our network stack. And our new interface for customizing Apollo's network stack is called Apollo Link. And it's a super powerful way to hook into the request cycle at any point to either process or retrieve your data. And a really cool thing about it is it's uh, powered by observables instead of promises, so you're no longer tied to returning a single value. And then uh, wrapping all that on the top level, you have Apollo Client itself, which is really just like a thin orchestration layer uh, that manages the communications between the network stack and the cache. So in fact, we actually already have an alternative cache that you can choose from for Apollo Client 2.0. It's called Hermes, and it's built by Ian McLeod and the amazingly talented team at Convoy. Um, and Convoy had a problem. So their payloads were very large, very nested, and, th and they needed to be this way for business reasons. And they were experiencing uh, slow reads and writes due to the normalization process that I told you about earlier. So what they opted to do was build a graph-based cache that uses references instead of pointers and, and instead of pointers and an identity map. So they didn't have to reconstruct the, the shape of the result each time, which was really slowing down their reads. So um, you know, after running the test, this resulted in a significant improvement for cache reads. I don't want to quote exact figures because I know they're still working on uh, releasing those performance benchmarks, but take my word for it, it's absolutely amazing. And I think this story really speaks to the power of a, uh, the modular architecture of Apollo, Apollo Client 2.0. If you have an idea, you can build it, and you can share it with the community, and then we all can benefit. Um, and 
when I say everyone, uh, that's React, Angular, and Vue developers. You know, it's decoupled from the Vue layer. So this is something that we can all really get behind. And I think we'll see a lot more custom caches being developed uh, in the weeks to come for things like local storage. I mean, the, the sky is really the limit here. So let's circle back to our network stack, Apollo Link. And I am super excited for Link because I think it's really going to revolutionize how we use GraphQL to retrieve and process data in our applications. My coworker, James Baxley, likes to describe links as uh, components for your data because it's really easy to compose them and chain them together. And they make it easy to customize the control flow in your application because you can hook in at any point in the request cycle. So let's take a look at what this looks like. So here we're using the same HTTP link uh, from before to retrieve our data. And now we're also using this from method on the Apollo link constructor. And what that's doing is it's chaining it on to the HTTP link. So um, you know, if the request happens to fail, we're going to retry it on an interval uh, for a maximum of 10 times. And you can kind of configure this however you like. And in, in order to chain them together, use this from method. And it takes an array of links. So you can also do more complicated control flow. So here we're using Apollo link dot split, um, which takes a function and then branches the control flow depending on the result. So here's a pretty common use case here where people want to use WebSockets for subscription and then um, HTTP for queries and mutations. So here what we're doing is we're looking to check and see if we have a subscription. If we do, we're going to send that traffic over WebSockets. And if not, we're going to send it over HTTP. Um, so just using the split method makes it really easy to kind of compose this in your application. It used to be a much more complicated process before with 1.0. So we're really uh, happy to see that kind of uh, opened up to our users and making their lives a lot easier. So links can either be non-terminating or terminating. So non-terminating links are kind of your error handling links. They're your middleware. They're your retry links. They're the ones who kind of process your data. And then on the other hand, we have terminating links. And these ones, they have to be the last in your chain because they're the ones that actually retrieve the data. They return an observable, which then fulfills with a result. Um, so those are things like the HTTP link and then the WebSocket link, which we saw before. So it's really easy uh, to create your own just by passing a request function into the Apollo link constructor. And the function takes the GraphQL operation. And what I mean by operation are things like query, mutation, and subscriptions. And then they return an observable. So to continue the next link onto your chain, if it's a non-terminating link, you have to call forward on the operation to pass it to the next one. And within the body of the function, you can kind of uh, do whatever you want. You can use it to set headers and credentials uh, on the context, which is really useful. And all links have access to the context. So you can actually set context from within your React components as well. So it's a great way to communicate between your UI and the network stack and then between links in the stack as well. Um, you can also choose from a community link. Um, I really love this one. It's brand new. It's by the maintainer of Apollo Angular, Camille. And what he's doing here is he's using a custom link that uses Angular's native HTTP module to execute requests instead of the HTTP link that we saw earlier. And this is really cool because the Angular RxJ, uh, the Angular HTTP module uses RxJS observables. So you can use all of the RxJS operators on your GraphQL query observables, which is super powerful. So as you can see, um, since links allow you to really hook into the request cycle at any point, you can start to get really creative with how you're retrieving and what you're doing with your data. So the next section of this talk is going to feature some really weird experimental stuff. Um, it's possible because of links. So who's ready to learn more? <laughs> <laughs> So OK, remember this diagram from earlier? We had data, and it was being loaded from a GraphQL server. But what if we could switch out that GraphQL server with anything else? I mean, since links can hook into the request cycle at any point and customize where you're getting for your data from, you can theoretically request data from anywhere. And as long as the data coming back is, uh, is some sort of JSON response, you should be able to query that source using GraphQL and then get back uh, the fields that you want. So what if you could query local data in your application? 
things like network status, things like routing, any application level data that you currently use something like Redux or MobX for, and store it in Apollo client. And the main benefit of that is you get all the same caching, ease of querying, all the bells and whistles that come along with Apollo client. Um, so it's, it's kind of, if you've used GraphQL before, this kind of seems very natural, but you can very easily express state changes in your application with GraphQL just as a series of queries and mutations. So here um, we have a query. This is kind of shorthand for a query, but we're just determining to see whether uh, our network is connected. And uh, here we have an update network status mutation that upon some listener uh, will call this mutation and then update the result in our store. And then all of our components from all of our application can then query that data and then reactively update um, based on when it's changed, kind of like in the example that I showed you earlier. So what if I told you you could already do this today? Um, not a lot of people know this, but it turns out you, you already can. So here we're using the network query from the previous slide to update Apollo client when the network status changes. Another component is able to query the information from the store, that one up top, and display it in their UI, which receives automatic updates once the network status changes. So here's how you would accomplish this. Um, to be honest, it's kind of you know, long-winded, but it's, it's really cool to kind of see the power of Apollo client. Um, here we're just using like a, a network info uh, helper from React Native Web. And initially, we have to call uh, client.writeQuery, and this is kind of going to change depending on whether you're using React, Angular, or Vue, but if you're using React, you can just get access to it from the props, and then you write this query into your store, um, and then the data is the data that you're actually writing. Um, and then you can even pass in a type name if you wanted to do some sort of type checking. Um, and then, so when the connection changes, we have this event listener, and it's then going to call a function. So in this function, handle connectivity changes, um, we're then going to update our query, and then all we have to do there is just pass some sort of updater function, which will then update the data in the store. So I think this kind of feels a bit clunky. We have two higher order components in, either, um, in order to get the functionality that we need, and it only works by passing in queries. This actually doesn't work by passing in mutations. So ideally, we want to be able to use queries and mutations together as a more natural way to update and query the store. So this is really uh, becoming our priority in the next couple weeks. We want to make sure that your experience managing local state in Apollo is as easy as possible. We want it to be as natural as describing your state changes with GraphQL and letting Apollo client just take care of the rest. No more action creators and no more thousands of lines of boilerplate. And that's why we're announcing Apollo Link State. Um, so I am over the moon excited about this one. It will use a client directive to specify the fields that should be retrieved from the client. And you'll have the ability to specify custom resolvers to determine how data will be read and written to the cache. Um, and it's coming soon, like really soon. As soon as we get back from all our conferences and the traveling, um, we're going to work on this and have this released to you because I think it will be really helpful uh, for everyone. So the setup uh, is really minimal. You're just using links here. So this is very similar um, to kind of the examples that we saw earlier. We have this with client state link function, and it takes um, a resolver map. And then uh, you know, in other files, you're going to specify this resolver map. And I really see us kind of splitting these out um, in terms of features. If you're like familiar with the Redux duck pattern, I kind of see splitting them out. Um, by feature is probably the best way to do this. And then you can kind of merge them together into this larger resolver map, and then you, um, you add it to the link. So that way, when a client request comes in, it can match it against this map and then return the data that you need. So like, what do these resolver maps actually look like? Um, so here, this will look very similar if you've used our server implementation before. OK, so who here has used like, uh, GraphQL tools, like our server implementation? A couple show of hands. So this should be pretty familiar if you're used to it. Um, you'll define your resolver map, and it takes the same arguments, exactly the same as the one on the server. Um, and the only main difference here is that we actually have access to the cache on the context, which is that third argument, um, to the function. And then from this direct cache access, we can uh, call a write, 
we can read. Um, this still isn't like completely fully baked yet, but we're thinking of maybe doing some sort of like default, like you would say here, um, so you don't have to write custom resolvers for every client side field. It would kind of do this default for you. I think that would be kind of cool. Um, and then the other thing that's really cool too is you can return the result and then um, you can specify the fields that you want to get back from the mutation and then you can use them in your components. So I've used the word directive a bunch. Um, what do I mean by that? So the directive, it would be that at client you see here on the end and marking your fields with the at client directive will tell Apollo Link to retrieve the data from your client resolver map. So that's how you would specify that um, a field needs to re be retrieved from local state. <coughs> and then, um, you know, once you have that all set up, you just connect your component as you would normally do. This is exactly how you do uh, mutation in the API today. And it just all kind of does it seamlessly, um, which is really exciting because you'll just, you know, be able to use these queries and mutations in your components the same way that you would use them today. So I said this word a couple times, like what exactly is a GraphQL directive? So what they do is they change how you get your data, um, but they don't change the shape of your result. So, you know, there's been a couple of directives proposed. You have things like defer and live, and basically um, defer, for example, you can specify a field that if you know it's going to take a long time for the result to come back, you can have uh, the the part that's already back and push it um, via like some sort of stream mechanism and then once you get the result from your deferred query back, then that goes to the client as well. Um, so once again, it's not really changing the shape, but it's just changing how you get your data and when. And this is already in the GraphQL spec, so this is nothing out of the norm. Um, we're just kind of going along what's with what's already in the spec and then kind of building upon it um, to create additional functionality. So, okay. We're querying local data in Apollo, but what if you could query REST data in Apollo? I mean, it's not that crazy. Most REST endpoints can send back JSON, so we should be able to use GraphQL to query those as well without some sort of GraphQL server on top of it. Um, so that's why we're introducing Apollo Link REST. Um, and this sounds like some sort of like horse JS, like I'm trolling you guys, like, I don't know. It's like, it's very weird that the GraphQL company is putting out a REST link. Um, but it actually has like a couple legitimate business cases. Maybe, um, you know, you don't control the back end and you want to be able to experiment with Apollo in your application. Um, this is a really easy way to get started. So very similar to the directive that we saw earlier with client side fields, it's going to use a REST directive to query your REST data with GraphQL. And this hasn't been built yet, but we're working on it and it'll be released very soon. Um, so the API draft is like super similar to uh, the client link that we saw before. Um, but instead of a resolver map, you're going to specify some sort of endpoint map. So you'll have a default endpoint, um, and then you can also have an endpoint map. Maybe you have like an old API that you're using or you wanna be able to differentiate between different endpoints. Um, and then you'll be able to specify the endpoint that you want um, via context. And then when you want to query that data in your application, you're just going to use the at rest directive, specify an endpoint, um, and then the at type, we were kind of maybe playing around with some sort of type checking involved because I kind of haven't mentioned that part yet because we haven't gotten to it. Um, but, but yeah, it should, be, it should be really exciting. We're hoping to be able to somehow type check the results getting back from that, that REST endpoint. Um, so that was a lot of information, but um, you know, what if you could actually manage all of your data with Apollo? We have functionality for a GraphQL server. We're getting functionality for local data and REST. So it really becomes this like one-stop shop of data management in your application. I think uh, another really cool application of this too is that you can request from multiple sources in one query. So here we have like a completely mixed query of user data. We're querying a GraphQL server. We're using the at client directive to specify a client only field. And then we're using the REST directive to specify um, a REST endpoint. And you'll be able to do this with links um, because it's able to parse the operation. So this is super cool. Um, you know, you can kind of quickly seeing this scaling out of control. You have all this data in your application. Like, how do you get visibility into what's going on? 
Um, and I'm not sure if you've heard, but we recently just launched our newest product, Engine. And Engine is a, you know, it's a lifesaver if you're if you're running GraphQL in production. Um, we used to use the previous iteration, Optics, at Major League Soccer. It helped us catch a few mission critical bugs before we launched production. Everyone really should be on Engine um, because it allows you to trace every single query, um, every single field, get visibility into performance, get visibility into errors. Um, it's really just uh, a one-stop shop for everything that's happening in your application. And as you're adding more to the mix, like client-side fields and REST endpoints, um, it would probably be pretty cool if we had a link to aggregate that, all that data to and display in a really easy-to-use format. So that was a ton of information, so I just kind of want to recap um, everything that's going on with Apollo Client 2.0. So, um, you know, you heard from the community. It's really convenient. It allows you to write queries, not code, um, which is really awesome because you don't have to spend your time maintaining thousands of lines of state management boilerplate. Um, it's also really flexible, so you can design your ideal cache, whether that's graph-based, whether that's local storage, whether that's an in-memory cache, you have the flexibility to choose. You also have the flexibility to customize your network stack, um, which is really cool because now that you have the flexibility to do that, GraphQL can truly be a universal query language where you can query and store data from anywhere. The sky's the limit. As long as it returns JSON, it's fair game here. So I think this is all really cool because, um, as I said before, Apollo Client is like completely decoupled from the view layer. So whether you're a React, you're an Angular, or you're a Vue developer, you can benefit from everything that I just talked about today. And I think it's really cool because there's not uh, too often that we can kind of agree upon this common theme. And I think we can really learn from each other here. Um, so with that being said, um, whether you're a React and Angular or a Vue developer, I think Apollo Client's for you, and I'm really excited to see what we can build together. Thank you.